Okay, so everyone, uh, hello everyone, and thanks for joining in today. My name is Ashraf Gurgi. I am a professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, the School of Medicine, Department of Physical Medicine Rehab, as well as the director of the spinal cord injury at the VA hospital in Richmond. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Naza Kapadi uh, Dusayo Bayo. Uh, Naza Kabadi is currently in her final year of PhD in the Rehab Science Institute of University of Toronto. Uh, she's a registered physical therapist in the province of Ontario, Canada. Naza is a research associate at the Kite Research Institute, Toronto Rehab Institute, UHN. She also holds a clinical physical therapist position at the Rocket Upper Extremity Clinic at UHN. Her research interests include exploring the benefits of functional electrical stimulation to restore function following SCI and stroke. She's also involved, she's also involved in the development of upper extremity assessment tools with the goal of making them universally easily accessible. She recently developed the first 3D printer upper extremity outcome assessment tool called the 3D printed Toronto Rehabilitation Institute hand function test. She has over 10 years of experience in the upper extremity rehabilitation field and was involved in various projects using FES to improve upper extremity function in individuals with SCI. She was a key member in the development and commercial commercialization of the My End Move FES stimulator. She is one of the patent holders of the upper extremity reaching and grasping protocol. She has a 25 uh, plus peer reviewed publication in in the third area of interest. She has also served as invited expert on the upper extremity working group of the SCI High Committee. She has presented her work extensively both at the national and international conferences. So without further ado, um, I would like to uh, introduce Naz as the first guest speaker uh, of our FES and task uh, technology. Uh, task force um, that's part of ACRM ISIC, and uh, hopefully we will enjoy her presentation. Uh, Naz will present for 45 minutes, and at the end of her presentation, we will have 10 minutes for question. So if you have any question, just uh, hold on until she finishes her presentation, and then we will entertain the question towards the end. Thank you, Naz. It is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gorgi. So uh, before I start, I'm just going to quickly thank Dr. Gorgi for inviting me to present today and uh, ACRM for arranging this task force. Uh, so thank you. And thank you, everybody, for making the time to attend my presentation today. Uh, so like Dr. Gorgi mentioned, I'm a physical therapist by training, and I've been working in the field of FES for quite a while now. Um, mostly concentrated on upper extremity FES. We've done a little bit of work on training other body functions, but my main focus has been training upper extremity function. Uh, so in my talk today, it will be focused mostly on the use of FES for retraining upper extremity function as well. So uh, before I begin, I just have some disclosures to make. Uh, I am one of the patent holders of the methods of stimulations used on the mind move. And I have worked for MindTech, which is the company that manufactures the MindMoon stimulator, which is a very sophisticated FES stimulator. And I've worked as a paid consultant uh, for the company on various occasions over the past seven years. Uh, so the learning objectives of my talk today are, I'm hoping to cover uh, briefly the current landscape of transcutaneous therapeutic FES for upper extremity rehabilitation. Uh, then I will go into the depths of how we have used FES um, to retrain upper extremity function in the clinical trials that we've done out of our lab. And then I will wrap it up by kind of providing a little bit of input regarding where we are going from here on. So what are the next steps? What are we working on currently? And where we potentially visualize this field um, over the next few years. So specifically, first, it will be the role of FES in upper extremity rehabilitation, then a detailed account of methods, indications, and contraindications. And finally, the potential next steps. I will also talk about a few unanswered questions that we have, and hopefully I think that as a community, uh, we will be able to shortly, anyway, answer these questions. 
so my presentation outline is we'll go over current use of FES and then we'll talk about FES as a functional therapy. And that is the practice that we have adopted in our lab. That is how we've been using FES uh, for retraining, uh, walking, balance, as well as reaching and grasping. Uh, I'll present some clinical trial data that has come out of our lab. I will talk about the indications and contraindications, and I will move on to talk about the combination therapies. Uh, so this is a fairly uh, new evolving kind of field, uh, and I'll touch base on a few things, but I am positively sure that I might not be able to cover all of the literature out there, but at least kind of to get us thinking and brainstorming. And I'll wrap it up by the outstanding questions. So current use of FES, um, I kind of, after putting it in, I thought this slide might be a little bit redundant given that it is an FES group and everybody on this group is working in the field already. But since I have it on the screen, we'll kind of just talk about it a little bit. Uh, what I find fascinating in the definitions of FES is that uh, from very early on, like in the 1970s onwards, while FES was fairly new, like 10 years old maybe, in, at least in the field of rehabilitation, even at that time, researchers visualized FES not just as an electrical stimulation, but something beyond that. So even early on, when it was defined, it was defined as something that will help to produce a useful movement. Of course, now we have more understanding about neuroplasticity and we know that this is a key component for why FES might potentially work in patients. Um, so yeah, so just for that sake, I kind of left it in that um, it's pretty interesting to see that even early on, uh, researchers and clinicians realize that FES has, has more potential than just a normal electrical stimulation. Uh, so FES is about 60 years old now. I think 1960s was the first time it was used for uh, retraining function in neurological patients. Uh, and in these 60 years, it has undergone a transformational change, as we know, right? So the picture on the left-hand side is from the 1970s, and this shows a stroke patient that is uh, receiving FES to assist with hand opening. Uh, and at that time, I think what uh, researchers struggled with was the input, how to get the uh, stimulator to work, like what could be the input that would help uh, trigger the stimulation. And the other challenge was that uh, there were not enough number of channels to stimulate everything that we'd like stimulated in a particular patient group. So for example, here, this is only a dual channel stimulator and is helping the patient open the hand, but beyond that, they weren't able to do much. Uh, fast forward 60 years and what we have is on the right hand side, it is the mind move stimulator. It is a very sophisticated machine with way more number of channels and able to produce a much more physiological movement than what was achieved back then. Uh, and I will get into the depth of how the stimulator works and what are the, uh, what are the specifications in a little bit, but just kind of to provide an overview that we've come a long ways from when it initially um, started. So here I have uh, a few stimulators. This list is by no means comprehensive. It's just something that is, I guess, a little bit more popular than the others. And uh, some of these are FDA approved, some are purely research-based. So I spoke a little bit about the mind move. Other than that, we know S2, uh, Nest, sorry, Nest, uh, H200, that's a pretty popular stimulator. It is a commercial one that is uh, fairly, uh, popularly used in North America. And um, it uh, assists the patient for opening and closing. And it has both these functionalities where it can be used for retraining function as well as, as a prosthetic to help assist in function. Uh, other than that, we have the Excite, which I think is also fairly new. It is a 12 channel stimulator. I'm not quite sure about its FDA status. I want to say that it isn't, but again, don't quote me on it. Uh, but uh, this one, again, has the ability to produce various body functions, including reaching and grasping. And then the stimulator we have in the right-hand corner uh, at the bottom is the complex uh, stimulator. So this is a research-based stimulator. And my understanding is that this one, this particular uh, model is not manufactured anymore. Uh, this is a transcutaneous four-channel stimulator and we have used it a lot in our clinical trials. In fact, most of our clinical trials we have conducted using uh, this stimulator. And the very neat thing about this one is that it is fully programmable. Again, I will get into the details of the complex stimulator when I talk about the clinical trials done in our lab. But uh, this is what the state-of-the-art stimulators look like as of now. And obviously this is a stark difference between these stimulators that we are currently using versus what was uh, initially developed 
developed in the 1960s. So it's needless to say that over the past three, four decades, particularly, a lot of attention has been put into this, both by researchers and clinicians. And I think that uh, it is realized that this has a potential to uh, improve outcomes following not only spinal cord injury, but other neurological conditions as well. So where is the progress realized? So I, put it, I feel that this progress is realized in various aspects of FES. Um, first, the technical progress. So um, like I mentioned that previously stimulators would be one channel, two channel. Now we have stimulators that have eight and 12 channels. So essentially what this does is it allows us to replicate more physiological movements as they would be performed in able-bodied individuals. Another technical progress that has been realized, and we have experienced this firsthand in our lab, is that um, the current required to trigger the stimulation, the amplitudes required to get a good functional movement have gone down significantly. And I think that is really to the credit of biomedical engineers. I don't think we as clinicians can take credit for that. But nonetheless, so this is huge, right? When patients experience discomfort and pain, then obviously the treatment does not work, like they're not open to those options or not as comfortable with those options. So I think this is another huge technical advantage uh, that has um, that has been realized over the past few years. The other one is that now we have the ability to trigger the stimulation using various inputs, like various, we name it and it's there, right? And again, this is to the credit of biomedical engineers that they have kind of worked with um, clinicians to help us um, make it more user-friendly, make it more viable in all patient populations, ir irrespective of their level of impairment. Uh, as far as clinical progress goes, over the past two or three decades, there has been an ex exponential increase in the number of uh, clinical trials that have been uh, conducted in this space, right from pilot trials to randomized control trials. And we know that evidence is important. Um, we are all trying our best as clinicians to stick to evidence-based practices. Um, I'm not trying to downplay the need for knowledge translation. That is equally important too. But I think that the first step, however, is to show that a particular therapy works. Uh, we have a long ways to go before we can claim by any means that FES is best practice, but I think that we all potentially are comfortable saying that it definitely produces better outcomes when used as an adjunct to the re uh, current rehabilitation uh, therapy package. The other advance is in form of combination therapy. So this is a fairly evolving field. Um, a lot of combination therapies are being evaluated to see if that can further help improve outcomes uh, following rehabilitation. Uh, the ones that we have uh, experimented in our lab is uh, we've used robotics with FES, and we've also used uh, brain-computer interface triggered uh, FES. And when I talk about combination therapies, I will provide just a little bit of information. This is still fairly new to us as well, but I'll provide a, a little bit of uh, information related to what we in particular are doing in this space. So moving on to FES as we have been using uh, in the clinical trials conducted in our lab. So I think that first of all, I couldn't emphasize enough uh, how much we uh, pay attention to using FES in a very, very functional manner. And when I mean functional, um, it is really used as an assistance to produce activities of daily living. So patients are manipulating real life objects while they are being stimmed and we are trying to mimic the physiological movement as it would happen in able-bodied uh, or able-bodied persons as closely as possible. And in order to do that, or in order, so in other words, in order for FES to work in our experience, there are three key components that need to be met. So first is, the patient has to actively attempt the desired movement. So the voluntary participation of the patient during therapy is number one. It is very, very essential. And we, uh, we make sure that our patients are actively involved as best as we can during the entire therapy session. The next step is, so we're using the FES device to help the patient generate or complete the movement that they're able to do with the residual abilities that they have. So FES is really just an assistance to executing the desired movement that the therapist would like the patient to execute. Uh, and all of this is done under the supervision of a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. So to date, we've always used FES. Um, 
like it's always been used by registered physical therapists and occupational therapists, um, just because we find that that is a very, very important parameter. Uh, and the role of the therapist in this treatment execution plan is to guide the timing and quality of movement. So uh, the stimulator that we have actually gives us the ability to do that because it is once it is set up, then it can pretty much be operated using even your feet if you want. So you have your two upper extremities available, like you have your hands free to assist the patient so that the movement is as close to the physiological movement as desired. Uh, so like I mentioned previously, uh, for all of our clinical trials, we have been using the complex motion stimulator. It is a four channel transcutaneous stimulator that uses surface electrodes for stimulation and it is fully programmable. So what I mean by this is that um, if you look at the picture on the left hand corner, the white complex cards that you see are the programmable cards. So these are chip cards. And uh, once we evaluate the patient and we figure out what is needed for that for particular patient, then we are able to adjust all of the stimulation parameters according to that individual patient's need. So we are able to adjust the max amplitude that might be needed. We are able to adjust the ramp times. We are able to also adjust the pulse duration. So it's in the true sense, it is a very individualized therapy program. So really based on individual patients, we program the chip cards as the patients improve. We reprogram the chip cards based on the new requirements. So I think that this is a very um, very important feature as therapists, we know that individualized therapy is really important and that we have to be able to offer what the patient lacks. So I think that this stimulator truly helped us to be able to do that. And how does improvement take place with FES? The assumption here is that, again, you ask the patient to perform the movement irrespective of their ability to do so. What we are really asking the patient to do is to form an intention to move. So the patient is thinking about the movement and is trying to execute it. What the FES does is it superimposes the patient's effort. So obviously the patient has an impairment, they're not gonna be able to successfully carry out the full movement. So we're using the FES to supplement their effort so that the movement is successfully executed. And what this does is it sends the signal to the brain that, hey, the intention that was formed, that movement has been executed and this helps to rewire the brain. So we've been using that one, the Compex, for about 15, 20 years now, and uh, we've had very positive results with its use, especially for upper extremity rehabilitation. And this 15 plus years of research has resulted in the development of the mind move stimulator, which is the state of the art stimulator. Uh, so I will um, tell you what the benefits of mind move are over the Compex. So mind move is uh, it has, first of all, eight channels. So we are able to stimulate more muscle groups than we were able to do with the complex. Uh, and secondly, um, we made it user-friendly, like it is 100% user-friendly. And when I say that, I mentioned that with the complex, it is a programmable stimulator. So you'd essentially need a biomedical engineer on site to be able to help you program every time your patient realized an improvement. Uh, but, but with MindMo, what we've done is that we have designed protocols, keeping in mind all levels of impairment. So this machine has protocols to help assist reaching, grasping, or a combination of reaching and grasping. And this is various types of reaching. So there is a protocol on there for training, say, for example, forward reaching. Similarly, there's a protocol on there to train sideways reaching. Similarly, there's a protocol on there to train a palmer grasp or a pulpage. So you assess your patient and then you decide that what works for your patient. And then you go in there and you're able to directly select the protocol that you want to use. And then it will take you through the steps that are required to set your patient up for treatment. Once the setup is completed, then the stimulator is operated using the black push button that you see in the left uh, left hand bottom corner. So you can operate it with your hand, with your feet, whatever is um, convenient based on what you're uh, getting your patient to do for that session. Um, again, how it works, I think that we are still basing it on the same principles of neuroplasticity. Again, client forms an intention to move. FES superimposes their movement feedback goes back to the brain saying that, hey, there was an intention to move, that movement has been uh, successfully executed and this rewires the brain. Uh, so the types of grasp that can be trained with FES, and this I'm talking in particular about the FES systems that we are using. So both Compex and MindMove have the ability to train all of these different types of grasps. So we can do um, a lumbrical grasp where we have the MCPs extended and the sorry, the MCP is flexed and the IP is extended. So in an attempt to hold the book, 
We're able to do a lateral pinch for holding a key or a credit card. We're able to do pulp pinch. So this particular uh, picture shows grasping a peg. And we're able to also do uh, the palmer grass. So both the cylindrical and the spherical types. So this is what the setup would look like. So typically if I'm, uh, for example, training a cylindrical or a spherical grass for a patient. Uh, so I'd be using something like a ball or a bottle of water to retrain this. And my electrode placement would look something similar to what I have up on the screen here. Now, again, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that this all is using compact. So I do have the limitation of just four channels. So here out of the four, three are placed on the palmer aspect of the hand uh, and the forearm to assist with the grasping and then we one channel we are using on the dorsal aspect of the forearm to assist with the hand opening so this one is for grasping a book and here we are using the lumbrical grasp so uh, here as you can see that ideally we'd like to stimulate all digits of the lumbrical muscle but we have a limitation of channels so we are not able to do that complex only has four channels available so here we decided to use three channels to help produce the grasp and then one channel to help open. Uh, so this is a very classical example of how limitation in the number of channels kind of hampers our ability to do the ideal case scenario. And then this one is to train a pulp pinch. So as you can see that we are using two electrodes to elicit the grasping. And then there's a one, there's one electrode that is used for hand opening, which is not, uh, the picture is not on the screen. And these are the types of tasks that our patients typically do during a typical therapy session. So uh, like I mentioned earlier that we use real life objects and our patients are very actively involved. Given that SCI is a, a bilateral, uh, like SCI does have a bilateral upper extremity uh, involvement. So many a times we train bilateral upper extremities uh, simultaneously. So as you can see, the patient here has electrodes on both his upper extremities. We're using two different complex stimulators and um, he's doing bilateral, tasks. Sometimes we do unilateral tasks, but if the patient gets fatigued, then we train one arm, we go to the other, we come back to the first. So it really depends upon the patient's abilities and what we are trying to achieve out of a particular session. So now I'll present some clinical trial data from the clinical trials that we've done to date. <clears throat> So first I'll talk about the data from the subacute traumatic incomplete uh, trial, which was a phase two RCT. Um, so irrespective of the group allocation, all of our study participants received 45 minutes of therapy five days a week for 40 sessions for this particular trial. Uh, because these patients are typically inpatients at the rehab hospital, they are entitled to the routine uh, physiotherapy and occupational therapy that they'd get just by virtue of being inpatients at the hospital. And ethically, we cannot not let them have that because that is still considered best practice. So what we have done is we've designed our studies such that these uh, study participants would receive the one hour of conventional therapy that they would receive anyway. And then we would make sure that they had at least two hours of break, irrespective of what group they were in. For And after that, if they were in the intervention group, they'd receive one hour of FES. If they were in the control group, then they'd receive one hour of occupational therapy. And we did this five days a week for uh, the subacute population because they were inpatient. So it was easier for them. There was no travel required. So it was easier for them. But this might not always be the case. However, we do recommend that a minimum of three sessions per week be done to see good gains. Uh, so participant demographics, we had 12 participants in the control group and nine uh, in the intervention group. Uh, irrespective of group allocation, all of our study participants had sustained an SCI between zero to six months. They all had incomplete traumatic uh, injury between C3 to C7, Asia B to D. And median age for the control group was 51.5 years. Median age for the intervention group was 50 years. So statistically, there were no significant differences uh, as in terms of age, sex, level, and severity, or time since SCI. And uh, the outcome measures that we used in our clinical trials are the functional independence measure, so the FIM, uh, particularly the self-care subscore is where we pay more attention, although I think that we always did the full FIM. 
then the spinal cord independence measure, again, we pay more attention to the self-care SAT score given that we are retraining upper extremity. <clears throat> And uh, we also use the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute hand function test. So um, I believe that FIM and SKIM is fairly commonly used. So uh, most of you might already be aware of these measures. I'll just tell you a little bit about the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute hand function test so that you can better interpret the graphs that I'm gonna show after this. Uh, so Toronto Rehabilitation Institute hand function test is an objective test. It is um, It assesses unilateral hand gross motor function. And this was really developed out of a need um, when early on we started doing clinical trials, we realized that there are no objective outcome assessment tools that have been developed specifically for the SCI population. And this became a limitation because uh, we needed one of those to be able to see whether or not FES is more effective than um, other therapies that are currently being used. So it was really developed purely out of need. Uh, what the test does is it has two components to it. There is an object manipulation component and uh, there is a strength component. So for the object manipulation component, uh, we use 10 day-to-day -day objects and the participants uh, are required to manipulate these objects in very intuitive ways as they would in day-to-day -day life. And we score uh, their performance on a scale of zero to seven where higher scores indicate better performance. And uh, for the strength component of the test, we measure strength of lateral pinch, circular torque, and eccentric forces uh, using a dynamometer. So this part of the test is very objective. The idea behind including these two components is, so the component one is very functional in nature. And even as a patient or a participant in the study, they would be able to understand what these gains mean. And I think that that is really gaining a lot of importance lately, that uh, there's a lot of emphasis on developing outcome measures that carers and patients themselves have some understanding of. So that was the idea behind that one. The strength component became important because for therapy planning, like if we as clinicians uh, have to decide what the next steps are, then we need some objective measure to kind of guide our therapy plan. So that was the reason why the test was designed the way it was. And uh, actually on, not too long ago, a couple of years ago, we started testing the 3D printed version of this test uh, with the... Um, with the idea of making the test universally available because this was developed a while ago, the original test, and uh, we had a lot of interest in it, but how to get the test to clinicians uh, within and outside of Canada was becoming challenging. So that was our motivation to develop the 3D printer test. And now it is already validated in the SEI population. So um, it's good to go basically. Uh, so now moving on to the results. So first I present the results from the FIM self-care uh, subscore. Uh, what we see right now on the, um, on the slide, uh, the gray bars, these are the baseline scores for individual participants in the control and the FES therapy group. And this is again, just the upper extremity component. So it's only up to zero to 42. And here, the orange bars that we see are the gains that were realized upon completion of their participation in the study. Uh, so as we can see that irrespective of group allocation, all of our participants improve. But as is very obvious from the graph, the gains realized in the FES therapy group were significantly larger than the gains realized in the control group. So the median change score for the FES group was 25.5 points, whereas for the control group, it was 9.5. Moving on to the skim self-care subscore. So again, what we see on the graph right now, the gray bars are the baseline scores. And again, this is only the self-care subcomponent. So it's only zero to 20. And again, the orange bars are the gains upon completion of their participation in this study. So again, everybody improved on uh, this particular outcome measure as well. However, the gains in the FES group are significantly larger than those in the control group. So the median change score for the FES group was 12, whereas the median change score for the control group was three. Uh, moving on to the results from the chronic traumatic incomplete SCI. So this is a phase one RCT. And for this one, uh, irrespective of group allocation, all our study participants received 45 minutes session a day, three times a week for a total of 39 sessions. And because these uh, uh, participants were coming from home, so uh, they were only getting the therapy as a part of their participation in the study. So the intervention group would receive one hour of FES and then the control group would receive one hour of occupational therapy. 
participant demographics for the chronic group. So we had three patients in the control group and five patients in the intervention group. All of our study participants were more than 24 months post injury, and they had all sustained an injury between C4 to C7, Asia B to D. And once again, there were no significant differences in terms of age, sex, level and severity, and time since SCI. So these are the results from the uh, chronic incomplete SCIs. So uh, the light orange bars are the baseline scores. The middle darker orange shade is the uh, score upon completion of uh, their participation in the study. So upon completion of 39 sessions. And the darkest shade of maroon is the six month follow up from baseline. So again, as we can see that irrespective of their group, everybody improved. But the improvements definitely, or maybe one person not in the control group, uh, but definitely the gains in the FES group are larger than the gains in the control group. So these are the main gains, uh, mean score gains. So for the uh, control group, upon completion of therapy, when we averaged out uh, the improvements, it was only zero for the control group, whereas it was 4.6 uh, for the FES group. And um, these gains, so for the FES group, the gains that they realized upon completion of participation uh, actually doubled after uh, the six month follow up. So this is huge. I think what we are able to see uh, at the follow up assessment is uh, really very convincing that um, this does help to improve outcomes in the long term as well. These are the skim self care sub scores again pretty much same results. So mean gains for the FES group upon completion of participation was 2.2, whereas 0.7 for the control group. And at six month follow up, we are at 3.6 for the FES group and 1.7 for the control group. And uh, this is uh, for the TRI hand function test. So again, we saw larger improvements as is obvious from the graph here on the, uh, in the FES group as, con as compared to the control group. So this is only the object manipulation. So the first component of the test that I was referring to uh, where uh, they manipulate 10 objects and they're scored on a scale of zero to seven. So that's the reason the scoring is from zero to 70. Mean gains 4.4, 5.6 at follow-up, 0 and 1.7 for the control group respectively. And this is just an overall graph to give an overall idea regarding uh, what our two date clinical trial results uh, data have shown. So this is all SCI subjects mixed methods. Uh, so the graph that I will show you in a second includes 55 subacute SCI participants, including both uh, incomplete as well as complete in both treatment as well as control group. So the blue bars are uh, the baseline scores and the orange bars are the improvements after 40 sessions of therapy. And as is obvious from the graph here that uh, participants in the FES group have realized uh, larger gains in function as compared to participants in the control group. So, uh, so that is the data from our clinical trials. Um, now, how and why does FES work? So this is an interesting question. And uh, again, I think that we have a far better understanding of neuroplasticity than we did maybe two, three decades ago. So, and uh, with uh, newer um, investigative methods that are available, we are able to gain better and better understanding of it every day. Um, so I think that how it works, I think that like I emphasized before that because we are using it in a very, very functional manner, uh, this really helps to tap into the benefits that one would get by task specific repetitive training, right? This is at the core of many newer rehabilitation therapies that are being researched, including activity-based therapy. We're really trying to see that we are training in the area where we want to see improvement. And um, as far as why is concerned, I think there are a lot of different theories that are postulated. I think that uh, what researchers um, are trying to kind of claim is that there are improvements at multiple levels within the CNS. So right from the brain to the spinal cord to the peripheral, we are seeing improvements everywhere. And the total outcome that we see is by virtue of these combined effects that we are witnessing. So now I'm going to show you a few patient videos from some of our studies. So this particular video is from a subacute uh, C5 um, SCI participant. And uh, the task here that we are expecting her to perform is uh, to actually lift the sponge off the supporting surface and to manipulate it. And as we can see that she's having a hard time uh, even grasping the sponge. So this is baseline. 
And now this is after she completed 40 sessions of therapy. So again, same expectation, lift it up, manipulate it, and then uh, replace it back on the table. So we can see that she was able to grasp it with relative ease. And now... So this task was included in the repertoire of the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute hand function test because very commonly we manipulate objects that are free form like a pillow or a bed sheet. So we want to see whether or not if they had to do that in day to day life, how much success they would have. And like we saw that there's a huge difference between the before and after. This is another participant here. The participant is expected to lift the book off the supporting surface. Again, this guy is subacute. And this is now him again after 40 sessions of therapy. So not terribly easy yet, but he's able to successfully complete the task. Uh, moving on to indications for functional electrical stimulation. And here, when I talk about indications, I've almost made FES synonymous with mind move because now we are using more and more of mind move. Um, but I think that that potentially might be applicable to most, most of the FES stimulators that are uh, out there. So uh, when we are uh, using FES, we start the screening process. So first we ask the question that is the injury an upper motor neuron injury or not? So if the answer is yes, that it is an upper motor neuron injury, then we continue with further screening. Uh, then we ask the question that is the impairment in the upper extremity or are you trying to train something differently? And given that mind stimulator is solely an upper extremity device only as of now, it is FD approved only for retraining upper extremity function. So if you're, uh, if you're answering yes to the question of whether or not there is an upper extremity involvement, then we can continue with further screening. This might not be true for other FES generic stimulators that, are, that can be used to train any body function. Um, so then are the muscles stimable when you, uh, we typically, when we're using FES uh, for clinical practice or for research, what we do is that we dedicate one session to see whether or not we are getting a response from the stimulation, because as we know that sometimes with SCI, patients might have sustained a lower motor neuron injury as well. So in which case, if the muscles are denervated, then we might not get a response. Uh, so we want to screen for that. We want to make sure that the muscles are responding to the stimulation. Another case scenario that I'd like to bring to everybody's attention is uh, if the participants are chronic, like if they're years post injury, then there might be significant atrophy by virtue of which we might not get a response. But those participants for our chronic studies, we've not automatically uh, excluded them. What we have done is what we did rather is that we introduced a, st a strengthening phase. So we bring them in for about four or five weeks where we would use the FES to kind of help them build the muscle bulk required to elicit set of physiological movement. And once we are there, then we would start training uh, using functional movements as we do for all of our other participants. Then we move on to see whether or not the patients are cognitively intact. In SCI, that's not so much of an issue, but stroke, it might sometimes be. Uh, so if the answer is yes, the patient is cognitively intact, then we go on to further screening. If the answer is no, the patient is not cognitively intact, then we might decide not to use the FES because like I mentioned that uh, voluntary participation of the patient is essential as far as we know. But again, when we get to the unanswered questions, I'll probably bring this up. And I think if we all can kind of talk and discuss about it, I think that would be helpful. Uh, then the next question we ask is that, is the patient, has the patient received Botox recently? Uh, if the patient has, then for mind move, this becomes a contraindication, uh, may or may not be for a, all FES stimulators, but at least for the first three months, if the patient has received Botox within the last three months, we say that it might not be effective. If there is no history of Botox, then we continue with further screening. And the next thing we want to find out is, does the patient have a disorder of seizures? And if yes, then um, FES is contraindicated. If no, then we continue with further screening. We want to make sure that the patient has um, does not have any implanted devices like a cardiac pacemaker. If it is yes, then you know, mind move becomes a contraindication. Uh, similarly, if the patient has a metal implant at the site of stimulation, so for example, patient might have had a broken bone and has an implant in the forearm, then, uh, and if forearm is where you want to stimulate, then uh, it would become a contraindication. 
But if the answer is no, then you can proceed with the mind move stimulation. So where we have used mind move successfully is stroke, spinal cord injury, uh, traumatic brain injury, cerebral palsy and cervical myelopathy. Cervical myelopathy, we have some data uh, for, as far as clinical trial is concerned, but I think in clinical practice, they're using it. Uh, similarly for brachial plexus as well, we have some data, but I think as far as clinical practice goes, I think that clinicians are using it. If it is none of the above conditions, then you're on your own. We've never tried it in past, so you're unable to comment whether or not for other uh, upper motor neuron type of lesions, uh, whether or not mind move would work. Uh, so moving on to contraindications for FES, and these are pretty generic, I think, for any FES stimulator. So cardiac pacemaker becomes an automatic contraindication. Uh, skin lesions or a rash at the potential electrode site would be, again, another contraindication. Then a malignant lesion at the site of stimulation would be a contraindication. If the patient has uncontrolled autonomic dysreflexia, then we typically don't bring them in. Uh, denervated muscles is, again, another uh, contraindication for uh, stimulation. So now to the next segment on combination therapy. So like I touched base in the beginning, we have tried uh, FES in combination with robotics as well as in combination with brain computer uh, interface triggered FES. So robotics, we have limited experience. We've done maybe one or two clinical trials in that space. And um, in our experience, I that was a while ago. And at that time, the FES stimulators, we used a different kind of FES stimulator. It was in the complex. And I think at that time, the limitation was that and uh, because the FES pads need to be wetted, like the electrodes, wet electrodes were being used for that trial. And that kind of became a big hindrance because we had to almost discontinue sessions to wet the electrodes again, to make sure that the stimulation was of sufficient intensity. So that was one thing. But beyond that, I think that it is something that is uh, achievable and might have potential benefits over purely FES, especially in terms of increasing intensity of therapy. As we know that, um, therapist ratio to patient ratio is not that great in clinical settings. And we also know that uh, intensity of therapy uh, does have an impact on the outcomes that we see. So from that perspective, I think robotics has a lot of potential. And if you're able to successfully combine these two therapies, I think that that would result in better outcomes for our patients. But like I mentioned that we ourselves have limited uh, experience in this space. The other thing that uh, we have uh, started doing um, is combining brain-computer interface with FES. So that is, that is something that uh, we have started doing on patients not too long ago. We've done some case studies in stroke and we've done uh, a pilot um, clinical trials in spinal cord injured patients. So basically what we do is instead of the therapist triggering the stimulation using um, the push button, the stimulation is triggered by the participant's own voluntary intention to move. And the huge advantage that this provides is that um, the timing of stimulation becomes more and more accurate. Like when I, as a clinician, am trying to trigger the stimulation, it is my best judgment as to when the patient has formed an intention to move. Uh, and then I try to align my stimulation with that one. However, if the patient, so this might be easier in patients who have some voluntary movement, because obviously you're able to see the movement and well, you know that the patient has formed an intention to move and is trying to execute the movement. But in patients who have a, a very severe impairment and who have no residual uh, motor function, like who have nothing, you cannot even uh, palpate a contraction. So in those patients, it becomes very tricky to know exactly when, uh, when to trigger the stimulation. And with um, BCI, what happens is that we are, taking, we are taking the guessing game out. So basically patient forms an intention to move and that patient's own intention is triggering the FES. So when we do sessions uh, using brain computer interface uh, triggered FES, what we do is once a patient is ready to start the movement, the therapist will give a cue that, okay, well, I want you to reach and grab this object, for example. And at that time, I am triggering, uh, triggering the BCI. So there's a switch that I press, which engages the brain, uh, which engages the BCI. Uh, and then if the patient is able to successfully think about the movement, then that will actually trigger the FES and the movement is successfully executed. Sometimes the patients cannot. And then in that case, the therapist would have to press the switch again to trigger the FES. 
So it gives us the ability to see whether or not the patient is actively involved in therapy. We want to think most of the times our patients are because they're there to improve. Uh, and secondly, in case if the patient is not able to, by giving the therapist the opportunity to trigger the stimulation, we are taking the frustration component out because we have seen this firsthand, that sometimes it is very frustrating for the participants that they might be trying, they might not be able to focus, sometimes it is technical glitches, that they're not able to trigger the stimulation. So that's the reason we gave the therapist the ability to trigger the stimulation in scenarios where the patient is not successfully able to do that. Um, so, uh, so this is how our BCI setup works. Uh, the huge advantage of our BCI setup is that it is using only three channels, which is huge, I think, in the engineering field, uh, because it reduces the setup time significantly. So for our sessions, we need about, um, we need about one hour uh, to do the whole thing. So including the donning and doffing of the EG electrodes, the FES electrodes, 45 minutes of the actual therapy, and then doffing the entire system. So everything can be accomplished in about one hour. So I think that this uh, provides a great promise as far as its adoption and clinical practice is concerned. So this is data from uh, the SCI trial that uh, we completed not too long ago. It was actually cut short because of COVID. We were hoping to recruit more participants, but uh, COVID struck and we had to kind of stop, uh, stop recruiting. Uh, so anyway, but this was a single arm interventional study where uh, we aim to recruit 10 participants, 10 subacute, 10 chronic participants. The data that you see here is from the subacute study. Uh, uh, and all participants underwent the same protocol. So everybody received 40 sessions of uh, BCI triggered FES therapy. And the assessments were done at baseline upon completion of 20 sessions and then upon completion of 40 sessions. Um, and what you see, the graphs that you see here, the BCI FES T data is from the current trial that I just spoke of. And then we were just curious to see how this data compares to 40 sessions of conventional therapy. And we had this historic data available to us and the inclusion exclusion criteria were identical to the ones that we used for the BCI FEST. So we made these comparisons to kind of gain an understanding whether or not BCI FEST might provide a little bit more advantage than what we've been doing already. And as we can see that uh, although we do realize gains even with conventional therapy, but the gains with BCI are larger within the same time frame. So at 20 sessions, the gains are approximately uh, the same as the COT. But then if you go on for 40 sessions, you see that the improvements are larger. So uh, this is kind of encouraging. Um, this is still fairly new to us. Um, we are still only doing pilot trials, but we're hoping to do larger studies to kind of get a better understanding of uh, benefits of BCI FEST. Uh, so I want to show you a couple of videos from this uh, cl uh, recent clinical trial. So this first one is from a chronic SCI participant. And oh, I hope it works. Okay, there. So this is from session six. And what I'm trying to train here is for the patient to be able to pick up the bottle and drink water by himself. Uh, this guy is, uh, I think, a year out and uh, he is, um, he was a C4, C5 injury. So um, he had significant improvements in his shoulder, but as you can see that he's nowhere even close to being able to do this functionally on his own uh, at home. And this is session 33, so less than 30 sessions of uh, BCI FES. And as you can see that he is able to lift the bottle by himself, bring it to his mouth with relative ease. He, still had, he was still struggling to uh, achieve the hand opening part, but still not too bad. And then I have another video from the subacute study. So this is a subacute and complete traumatic SCI C4 Asia C. And as you can see here, what we want the patient or rather the participant to do is to lift the mug and bring it to his mouth, uh, pretend as though he's drinking out of it, bring it back and then pour out of it. So that's the task he's expected to do. And at baseline, he wasn't quite able to do that. This is after 12 sessions of BCI FESD. And as you can see that, no problem, he's able to successfully execute the task. And he's gonna try the same thing using his left upper extremity. And as you can see that it's extremely difficult for him. He cannot even bring his arm to the object. And now this is again after uh, 12 sessions of intervention. 
So again, not perfect, but definite improvement from uh, baseline. So here, what the participant needs to do is to pick up the paper. It's a 3D printed paper, so it looks different, but his goal is to pick up the paper and flip it uh, both ways and then put it down on the table. And as you can see that the, he's having some challenges. This is after 12 sessions of um, intervention. And so there now he has a way more controlled movement than he did before. So again, with the left hand, he's not having much luck before intervention. And now this is him after 12 sessions. And these are the scientists that are involved in the execution of the project. So uh, moving towards the unanswered issues. So like I said, that we've been doing this for a while now. However, we are still left with certain pressing questions that we don't have the answer to. Uh, so first of all, what are the ideal candidates for FES in whom we can guarantee from the get-go that yes, for this particular patient, FES will work? So that we kind of have some understanding. We know that FES produces better results in subacute phases. We know that FES produces better results in incomplete uh, SCI injuries. So we have some understanding, but how about when we complicate things a little bit? How about the, if there is a huge sensory involvement? Does that have an impact on improvements that we see? How about if patients have severe, severe spasticity? Does that have an impact on the improvements that, may, that would be realized? Um, then uh, combined. So, uh, does homework have anything to do with improvements that we see? We typically ask our patients to try and use their upper extremity as best as they can outside of their uh, participation in research. But does that have any bearing? If one person does do that and another person doesn't, would that impact the amount of improvement that we see? Then what is the optimal dosage? So I know that there's a whole lot of data regarding FES use, but I, uh, as far as I know in literature, there are no dedicated studies that have looked at, well, 10 sessions, 20 sessions, 40 sessions, 80 sessions, what is the difference? Is there a difference? What we have typically recommended is that at least 20 sessions of therapy is needed to see some change. And if you want to really see good functional improvements, then you want your patient to get at least 40 sessions of therapy. And as far as frequency is concerned, we typically recommend three to five times a week. But this is purely by virtue of why, what we have been doing in our lab. Again, we have not done a systematic study to observe, uh, to recommend this either, but this is just observational. We have seen that after 20 sessions, yes, there are changes on the outcome measures. And after 40 sessions, these changes transform into functional changes. The other question is, does therapist skill play a role? Like if it is somebody who has been using FES to nauseam, and if it's a, some, it's a fresh graduate out of university, is there a difference? Would that play a role in how the patient improves post-therapy? So my take home message uh, that I feel comfortable saying at this point, uh, having worked in this field uh, for a bit, is that I definitely feel that FES is a promising therapy for retraining upper extremity function and stroke. We've seen patients uh, walk out of um, the hospital with tears in their eyes, just by virtue of being able to do something that they couldn't imagine they would be able to do before they started. So it's um, so that is um, that is something. That is really something. Uh, as clinicians, it means a lot to us uh, when our patients are able to come and tell us that, hey, previously I was not able to eat by myself, but now somebody sets me up, I'm able to eat independently. So that's huge. Um, then I think uh, though it is critical to identify the correct candidates for FES treatment, I think that we all might want to refrain from saying that it is a blanket therapy that works for everybody. Um, as much as I'm passionate about FES, I am hesitant to tell my patients anybody that walks through the door that, hey, this will work for you. So I think that it is really critical that we kind of identify who are the best candidates for this. And then in our experience, we've always used FES as an adjunct to existing therapeutic techniques. It's never a sole therapy by itself. So we as therapists use stretching techniques, strengthening techniques, and other task-specific repetitive techniques as we see appropriate. Uh, we try our best to combine it with FES. Sometimes they're used even outside of FES. If my patient has a lot of tone, I might do some weight bearing for the first five minutes of the sessions before I actually start the FES training. So um, in our experience, FES, uh, when used as an adjunct to existing therapies, produces better results. 
And I'd like to thank our funders. Um, there are a lot of people behind what we do and without them, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. I'd specifically like to thank the CIHR, the Canadian Institute of Health Research by whom I'm funded uh, so that I'm able to do what I do. And thank you ACRM for giving me the opportunity to present and thank you Dr. Gorgi for, um, for having me. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for making the time to be here today. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. Uh, in fact, I have a lot of questions, but considering the time. I'm going to open the panel um, uh, for two questions uh, from our audience um, and uh, maybe later myself and you will uh, interact more about some of the interesting stuff that you presented today. Um, so uh, if, um, if any of the panels would like to uh, send questions, um, uh, one of the questions that uh, came to the panel, I was curious about the stimulable factor how would you objectively classify a muscle as not stimulable? I was not aware of the scenario in SCI. That is an excellent question. Thank you for that. Uh, so basically mm -hmm. when we do clinical trials using FES, what we do is that uh, as an inclusion exclusion criteria, we put this in that the muscle has to respond to FES and we do a screening um, session with the patients. So uh, we, just like we do for anybody else, we ramp up the amplitudes gradually and record the sensory threshold, the motor threshold, the functional threshold, and the max threshold that the patient is able to tolerate. So um, for the motor threshold is where the stimable aspect comes in. Uh, what we try to see is that when we are stimming the patient, are we able to even see a palpable contraction? And that's the least that we look for. And by virtue of having worked in this field for a while, we kind of have an understanding regarding the levels of stimulation and when to sort of expect the muscle to respond. Again, that's not a blanket statement. It changes from individual to individual. I couldn't emphasize the variability. Uh, but, and um, having done it on able-bodied, right? So we kind of know that in able-bodied, for example, with compacts, I'd expect a uh, 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 palpable stimulation at around say two or three milliamps. So in my patient, if I'm not getting a palpable contraction at seven or eight milliamps, then that's a cause for concern for me that am I going to get anything out of this patient? Then we, what we typically do is if we are not getting a palpable contraction, even with the stimulation, then we typically talk to the patient's physiatrist or go back to the doctor to consult that had the patient sustained a low motor neuron injury, has something been missed? while uh, the screening process happened. Um, and then if required, we do send them back even for them to screen for us one more time. Um, but uh, essentially, if it is a patient who is subacute and who's not responding to stimulation, then we just use that as an exclusion criteria and we don't have the patients uh, enrolled in the study. So that's how we have been screening our patients. We see the motor sensory and the functional threshold where we are able to produce a physiological movement. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, last question for today um, is, uh, I'm curious if you have a sense of how much of the improvements are you show are due to neuroplasticity versus the FES building up muscles mass plus the repetitive practice? That is an excellent question. And unfortunately, we are not able to titrate the effect right? Like I mentioned from the get-go that we have always used FES in combination with functional therapy. But what I can say is that our clinicians in the hospital also practice that independently. So when we, control, uh, when we compare the results with conventional occupational therapy, our occupational therapists are also practicing task-specific repetitive training. We are doing that in combination with FES. So we want to assume that the delta that we get between the two groups, given the baseline characteristics, is by virtue of the FES. And as far as physiological recovery goes, I think now we have a lot of evolving evidence. I think there's work, a lot of work done by um, Dr. Kalsi Ryan, and she has shown the recovery profiles where uh, no therapy might be given. And yet just by virtue of uh, neurological recovery, what kind of profiles we might see. So I think that there is some literature there about that one, but I, I want to believe that because I know my clinicians, I know the people that I work with, I know that what is being practiced outside of FES is very similar to what we do on top of the FES. So the delta that we see is by virtue of the FES. I don't know if I sound convincing enough. <laughs> I think that this is an important question and, um, and yet more research needs to end, 
to address this question in the future. Uh, we will allow one more question if you are quick. Uh, do you have any data on outcomes related to spasticity? Uh, could FES protocol decrease spasticity? I personally don't have data. Uh, I personally don't have data, but anecdotally, I can tell you that, uh, yes, FES helps to reduce spasticity. Okay. Because we've not used that as an inclusion exclusion criteria for our study, and we bring everybody in irrespective of their spasticity levels. So I think I'm comfortable saying that anecdotally, yes, it helps. So Naz, great uh, presentation today, and uh, thank you so much, and thanks to all the audience and uh, the attendee uh, for the ACRM FES Task Force uh, and Technology. Uh, so please join us in future uh, webinar, and uh, please don't forget our uh, annual meeting uh, in uh, September of 21. Um, and thank you all. And uh, at this point, we have to conclude our presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you.